Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this great privilege to come together and hear a story of faith. We're joined tonight by Michael Mason, a former evangelical Protestant, and he's a Catholic high school teacher in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Michael, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Oh, it's a real honor to have you and to, to hear your story. We've had, we're going to talk about it later, but uh, you went through Southern Evangelical Seminary as part of your part of your story, and we have, yep. a, have a number of your uh, your colleagues from there tell their stories on the show previously. So, yep. so excited to hear more about that. Great. Yeah. And, I'd, and the Journey Home had a great... Um, a big role in my conversion as well. There was probably literally every night for a couple of years when I would iron my shirts for work the next day, I would put on uh, one of your guys' programs to listen oh, to it. So well, the Journey Home has a special role in uh, my conversion as well. Uh, great to hear it. Glory to God. Yeah. You know, he's the author of the stories and we're, we're glad to be able to hear to help bring them to the world. So. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for being here. I'll, I'll invite you to take a step way back. Where does your journey begin? My journey begins, I'm from Northwest Ohio. Um, Fremont, Ohio is where I was born. Um, I was raised in a really good family. I have two wonderful parents, a great brother that I'm still very close to. I was very blessed to not only have uh, parents who, who loved each other and had a great marriage, but also I had an extended family with aunts and uncles and lots of cousins uh, where faith was important to all of us. And it was just a really positive way to grow up. It's really wonderful. Um, my parents uh, were committed to the faith. They're, they are Christians, but we weren't in church every single Sunday when I was growing up. They had the opinion that they wanted to expose me to Christianity but also they wanted to give me an opportunity to choose it for myself. Um, when I was in middle school, we moved to a town called Upper Sandusky, Ohio, which is about 45 miles south of Fremont. And at that point, I'm entering middle school, and it's time to consider baptism and confirmation. I was raised in a Methodist church. And so they take us down to uh, Upper Sandusky. As I'm there, uh, we start attending this church, and I start going to classes for confirmation. And we had a great pastor there. He was dynamic. When he would preach, he'd get, you know, he had white hair and his face would get all red because he'd get so passionate. He was like an old school Methodist right. preacher, which was really wonderful. Yeah. And so I just really took to him. Our whole family did. At that season in our lives, we'd started attending church every Sunday. Faith became very important to us. And I remember um, when our pastor was talking to us about um, his conversion to Christianity, accepting Jesus into his heart. He told us the story that he was at his farmhouse and he knelt down in his room next to the window overlooking the pasture and he accepted Jesus in his heart. And so when I decided I wanted to do that as well, I didn't want to mess it up. So I went home. Now we lived in town, so it wasn't quite as, as beautiful Picturesque. as his. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I remember getting down beside my window and I got my knees and I overlooked the backyard and accept Jesus in my heart because I didn't want to mess it up, right. you know, first time through. Um, but I had this great experience uh, with them. Went to church camp, all those things. At the end of middle school, we moved to a small town called Gibsonburg, Ohio, which is in between Fremont and Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rural community, you know, about 2,500 people, one stoplight. Uh, to some people, that might sound dull. To me, I, I just loved it because um, there's nothing to do. So you hang out with your buddies and fill your time. When we moved, though my faith was important to me, I didn't transition well. I remember getting a phone call from a, a gentleman that I met at a youth camp and asked if he'd be interested in doing a Christian group at my high school campus. And I was real honest with him. I said, I'm a new student, and I just don't feel comfortable doing that. And he nice enough said, you know, that's fine. Um, that moment was pivotal for me even all these years later because I didn't, my faith didn't come with me to high school, and it really didn't come with my family as much either. Um, when I got into high school, I had lived a very stereotypical um, Midwestern existence for a high school kid. We would go to church from time to time, usually Christmas and Easter. Um, we didn't talk about faith around the family and things I a lot, but it was important to my family and the wider family, but we weren't real committed to it. Um, I read the Bible from time to time, but most of the time I was really interested in, in playing football, playing baseball, and hanging out with my friends. For the first two years of high school, I would um, we would do just that. So on the weekends to fill our free time, we would play pickup tournaments in my driveway, three on three, and have brackets and play till midnight. Or we would um, string up lights between telephone poles and play tackle football so we'd have an outdoor stadium. So in that sense, it was a really like really beautiful way of growing up. But around my uh, being my junior year, um, I want to live a happy life. I know we all of us do. And I remember consciously thinking like, what is it that makes up a good and happy life? And I got the idea in my head, and I got it from people explicitly. It wasn't implied or picked up on television that part of living a good and happy life is drinking alcohol and partying. Um, I'm from a rural blue collar community. Yeah. Um, the guys will tell the old war stories when they're in high school as they played high school football and baseball and won these games. 
but you also had the, the wildness on the side. And when you're into sports like football and rugby, and uh, it tends to draw guys who are low on the wild side. And I found that very attractive. And so over Christmas break, my junior high school, um, I tried drinking alcohol for the first time because I thought that this is just what you do to live a well-rounded life. Um, from that point forward, alcohol became a pretty standard weekend activity. Um, my parents would not approve of this, so I want the listen listeners to know they would not approve of this. I'd hide it from them and yeah. put a lot of work into that. Uh, they were not the parents who were like, come on over to our house. Um, that did not fly. Right. Um, but alcohol, I'd start drinking on the weekends. Now, when you're in high school, I have great coaches and teachers and parents to kind of hem in my sin. And so a lot of the negative effects from it, morally and spiritually, didn't really, it didn't feel like they were taking root. There wasn't a lot of, of negative fruit coming from it, other than the, you know, the occasional hangover the next day and maybe the fear of getting caught. Mm -hmm. um, but really, I didn't experience a lot of the negative parts because you're exercising for sports, I'm in school, I have a lot of structure, and that was great. Um, I was a pretty good high school football player. And by the end of my senior year, I uh, was offered to play college football at mostly small schools. Um, but I had a choice to make to either go to small schools, which were mostly in small towns, which is where I grew up, or just try a different path. And during high school, I went to a football camp at Ohio University, and I just loved Athens. Hmm. Because when you're where I'm from, there's literally no hills for hundreds of square miles. Um, the only hills you have are overpasses for freeways. Right. And so when I went to Athens, Ohio, the campus is beautiful, and it's like going to school in the Alps yeah. for a Northwest Ohio kid because they have hills and it's beautiful. And, and Southern Ohio always had a charm for me because it's it kind of looks like the Shire. If guys read The Lord of the Rings, mm. it has that sort of feel down there. Um, but I fell in love with it. And so I decided I wanted to try something different and go to a big state school. So I chose to go to Ohio University. I went there with the intention to get a degree in education. I wanted to teach uh, history to uh, middle schoolers because I love American history. And I wanted to coach high school football. And so that was the goal is to get an education. Because I had it in my mind that I wanted to live this good and happy life and that um, partying was going to be a part of that, one of the reasons I chose Ohio University is because it has a reputation as a party school. And so I went down there with the full intention of sowing my wild oats for a few years. Um, I was not going to fail out, so I went to class and studied and did those things. I wasn't interested in that. My parents instilled a better work ethic than that in me. But I did. I went down there to drink alcohol and smoke weed and chase women. Um, my intention was to do that for four years. And afterwards, you know, probably continue drinking, but never to party beyond that. I figured at some point I'd meet a cute girl, have some kids, coach Little League, and move on with life. Mm -hmm. And so I just assumed that I would engage in this party life and everything would be great. For the first couple years, um, it was great. Um, not great in the moral sense, not great that how I understand greatness now, but in the moment it seemed like it was a really good choice. Um, partying's a lot of fun, it's very pleasurable. And you know, I had a, a good group of buddies to hang out with and it really, for the first couple years, seemed to work pretty well. Um, but because I partied, I partied very hard. I, we would go out on Tuesday nights, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays every week wow. for three and a half years. Um, and when I would go out drinking, it wasn't having two or three drinks over a game of pool. Um, it was I would drink to excess almost every single time. I was smoking marijuana um, every single day for the first couple years I was there. And so slowly but surely, that started to chip away at me, not only morally, but just physically in lots of ways. My... Um, as I was going through this, my sophomore year, I was in an education class with a girl named Corinne, and she was wonderful. Um, and we struck up a friendship. And the way we struck it up is that the, Corinne was an evangelical Christian. And we were in one of those uh, classes where they throw out questions for you to answer to get to know each other questions. Right, right. And the question was, what would you do if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? Why well, had enough good sense from my Methodist upbringing. I said, well, I, I would go to church. Because if I'm going to die tomorrow, I'm going to meet God, and i got to get myself right. Well, everyone else said all kinds of other bizarre things. But this little evangelical girl, that pricked her ears, and she was involved with a group from Campus Crusade for Christ, and they do initiative evangelism. Mm -hmm. So when she heard that, I mean, she was just like, this is a guy that I can talk to. So she and I struck up a friendship, and for two and a half years, we would probably talk about faith two or three times a week in depth. And I would bring the conversations up. Um, what I didn't know at that time is that she wrote my name on a prayer board that she and her roommates had, and they started praying for my conversion. And I had no idea about this. Well, as this is going on, we're having these great discussions, 
And I start feeling guilty. And not only that, but morally, I mean, things just with the party life are weighing down heavy on me. And I remember one night I was sitting on my buddy's uh, front porch and um, we'd out drinking all night. I'd gotten high and I was sitting on the porch, smoking cigarettes, staring up at the sky. And I was talking to God um, because I knew the way I was living. He didn't want me to live this way, but I just, I just, I love it. I love the party life. And I looked at him one point and I distinctly remember saying, I love sin more than I love you. And I said it vocally. And then when St. Paul talks in Roman, in the book of Romans, that God will hand us over to our sins, I'm utterly convinced that in that moment, God handed me over to my sin. Um, whatever shroud of protection he'd put around me at that point, he decided to pull back. Um, within a couple months, so this is um, spring break, my junior year of college. Right. I was at uh, I was home for spring break, and I went to Bowling Green State University to hang out with my buddies. And as we're hanging out, we partied like usual. I got drunk like usual. And when I woke up the next morning, something didn't feel right. Now, I'd have a, I've had horrible hangovers before, but this was just something was off. But I couldn't pinpoint what it was. And I remember driving home thinking, I just something doesn't feel right. But I didn't think much of it. That night, met up with a couple other buddies. We were watching a college football game and drinking White Russians. And I had probably seven strong white Russians, and I'm just not getting drunk. We went to a, a bar, a local bar there in town in Fremont, and just hung out the rest of the night. And I remember drinking beer after beer after beer. And the more I drank, I, I felt sober. It's like the first time that day I felt clear headed. Uh -huh. And I remember, I distinctly remember sitting at the bar thinking, this is bizarre. Like, why? I can't get drunk. And I realized at a point where like, I could drink as much as I want tonight, getting drunk's not in the cards for me. So I go home, go to bed. Next morning, wake up, this bizarre feeling returns. Um, I can't, can't pinpoint what it is, but it was a Sunday, so there's NFL football on. And I was in one of a side room at my parents' house watching a game, and I would find myself pacing in the room while I was watching the game. It was almost a little bit like an out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. where next thing I know is I realize I'm walking in circles. And then I'd, I'd be like, what am I doing? I'd sit back down, start rocking back and forth, stand up, walking in circles. And... Um, I kept waking myself up from this, thinking, like, what am I, sit back down. That night, my parents go to bed, this uncomfortable feeling's in me the whole time. I go to bed that night, because I'm like, I, I just need to go to bed. Like, I don't feel weird, I'll feel better tomorrow. And I go into my room, and I turn the light off to go to sleep, and I am terrified of the dark. Now, I'm 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I haven't been afraid of the dark since I was four or five years old. And I was utterly terrified. As soon as the light would go off, I mean, my whole body would like go into shock. Um, and I'd have to turn on right away. So I go out in the living room and I'm laying on the couch trying to go to sleep and I just can't. This uncomfortable feeling won't go away. And so I turn TV on and I just watch TV till two o'clock in the morning till I finally physically just fell asleep with all the lights on the TV on. Yeah. Next morning I wake up, my parents go to work, same feelings there again. So I'm home all day long by myself. Um, and as I'm by myself, um, I'm trying to figure out like what's going wrong with me. And so my mom had old psychology books and I'm a little bit of a reader. So I remember I would, I'd just start reading through that. Like what, like what's going on? Trying to self diagnose. Um, again, later that night, same thing, try to go to bed, turn the lights off, utterly terrified, have to go back out on the couch. And I don't remember if it was the next morning or a couple days later, but this kept happening. And one morning my dad gets up early to go to work. My mom and dad both do. And I remember my dad saying, why is Michael still, why does he sleep on the couch every night? Now, mind you, I'm home with my parents because I wanted people not to get the wrong impression of my parents. I wasn't out drinking the night before. I'm not using drugs. Like, there's no, like, clear sign that anything's wrong because I'm home with them each night. Right, right. And so my mom just, I remember saying something along the lines of, like, he's just, college kids are weird. Like, you know, he's falling asleep <laughs> watching TV. Yeah. And they kind of dismissed it. Um, but my, my dad did make that comment. I remember I was awake, so I heard that um, and kind of realized that I think something might be wrong. But I thought, you know what? I'll just go back to school, get back to my old routine. Everything will be fine. I go back to school and this feeling keeps happening um, and it starts intensifying. Um, for the next two months, every night I would go to bed, I was utterly convinced I was going to die in my sleep. Mm. Now, as we'll see in, in a few minutes, that wasn't what was happening, but um, I, I thought I was going to die in my sleep. And so each night, the terror that I'm going to die at any moment was with me all the time. Uh, I would go to classes and I'd be sitting in class I remember one distinctly, I'm sitting in a class with a, a ton of students, chairs are crammed together. And um, 
I remember being so terrified in that moment that I would just white knuckle grip the desk and just hoping no one would talk to me because all I was it took all my willpower to not run out of the room screaming. Wow. Um, it was really, really traumatic. I did this for two months and didn't tell anybody, not my parents, not my friends. I don't know what to tell them. And so finally I broke down and said, I need to go see a psychologist or something. So I go to the um, um, see a psychologist on campus and I walk in the room and he said, well, why are you here? I said, well, I'm crazy. He goes, no, you're not. You know, what do you mean? No, I'm not. Like you just met me. He goes, you're not crazy. He goes, crazy people don't know they're crazy. You think you're crazy. So you're not crazy. And I can't tell you, 20 years later, how much of a relief <laughs> that was when he said that. Right, right. Because I thought, okay, I'm not nuts. Because, yeah, right, people who think they're a glass of orange juice don't know that. Like, I do know I'm nuts. So it was very reassuring to me. Mm-hmm. So we start talking. I describe my symptoms to him. And he says, well, what you're having are panic attacks, anxiety attacks. Um, and so, which may not sound to a viewer that's never had one, probably doesn't, maybe doesn't sound as bad. Like, we've all been a little anxious before. Um, and so at, at first I was a little embarrassed, like this is messing me that bad. And the psychologist said, no, 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 panic attacks are utterly terrifying. And so he says, your reaction to what's going on is very normal and it's very understandable. And if a viewer wants to know what it's like to have an anxiety attack, think of the time in your life you're the most nervous, where you can't breathe, you feel dizzy, your heart won't stop beating, you feel sick. Um, when we feel those in normal day-to-day life, it's because something in front of us is making us feel right. that way. There's an object of the of the focus. Yeah. Correct. For me, it would happen out of the blue. Right. I'd be sitting in class taking notes, and this would just come on me, and I'm looking around, I can't see anything that's causing me to feel this way. Mm-hmm. And then, then you become anxious about the anxiety, and it just compounds. Yeah. So I tell the doctor this. He says, do you use drugs and alcohol? And I said, yeah, I do. He says, well, how much do you drink? And I read somewhere once that when you ask, ask somebody who has a problem with alcohol, how much they drink, it's always twice as much of what they say, um, which proved true the, for the me. I said, well, 10 to 12 a night. And it was probably, you know, if I'd start drinking early enough, it could be uh, oh, twice as much as that. Um, I said, 10 to 12 a night. He goes, well, you know, that's a lot of alcohol. I said, I know. And he said, well, what's happening is your body, you're getting so high that when you crash, your body doesn't know what to do. It goes into shock. And so and then when it goes into shock, it falls down underneath and it's got to bring you back up. And so um, he explains what's going on. He gives me some strategies to deal with it. He said, when these come on, there are ways you can settle yourself down. So he taught me how to breathe, diaphragm breathing. I could get a bag to breathe into. Um, and actually that, that train's come in a lot of help over the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but he explained me how to get it down. Yeah. I said, well, I'd like to see a medical doctor just to make sure I'm not dying for sure. And he goes, that's, that's a great idea. Go, go downstairs. They'll give you a physical. Get the physical. I mean, I wasn't in great shape because I'm drinking so much, but they said, no, you're fine. At that moment, I'm walking out. He told me, make sure you schedule an appointment. We'll meet again next week, start talking about, you know, some of these issues. And I was walking down the hallway and I thought, if I keep coming, he's going to tell me I have to stop drinking. I know what these are now. I'm not dying. And I really like getting drunk. So I'm just going to live with them. And so for the next year, I would get drunk on a Tuesday night, on Wednesday feel mildly anxious, then I would go on a binge Thursday, Friday, Saturday. By Sunday, I knew Sundays were going to be horrible. So on Sundays, I would just tough it out and try to relax myself, knowing that by Monday, I'd feel a lot better. I usually had meetings Sunday nights, so I'd have to spend all day kind of getting myself prepared for that. Um, And I just toughed it out for a year. Wow. So while this is happening, the girl I mentioned earlier, Corinne, is, is sharing the gospel with me quite a bit. And as she's sharing this gospel with me, um, I start realizing that like my sins, what's destroying me. It got to the point when I would brush my teeth, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I just just couldn't even look up because I didn't like the guy looking back at me. Um, And the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit was chasing me very heavily. And I think God, God was subtly reminding me that I'm handing you over to this thing, but I'm, I want to, I want you to come back. And in January 2004, it's my senior year of college, they gave me an extra year because I didn't do all my classwork for the party. And so I got that extra year, which would pay off um, a great deal. Yeah. But in January 2004, my senior year, it was a January day. It's snowy out and sunny. And if anyone's ever been in Ohio in the winter, a sunny day in January is rare. So it was a very beautiful day. There was white snow on the ground. And I was reading the parable of the soils, the parable of the sower, the four soils. And I'd read this passage a bunch of times. 
and I'm reading through it, and it talks about the fact that this, the God's word is like seed, and it falls on soil. And if it falls on rocky soil, that's super, or pardon me, um, soil that's hard, it just doesn't take root at all. But it can also fall on soil that has thorns and thistles, or has rocks and thorns. And in that one, the seed will take a little root, but it gets choked out by the cares of life. Though you know, um, being worried about what people think about you if you you take the word seriously, the pleasures of life choke it out. And then there's good soil that the seed sticks and grows and produces fruit. Well, I always had a fatalistic reading of this. Like I'm just a guy with, I'm, I'm too afraid of what people think about me if I took my faith seriously. I'm too attached to pleasure to give it up. I had a fatalistic reading. I'm always going to be the person with the rocks in the soil. So yeah, I read the Bible and it st- sticks a little bit and then dies. I go to church and then it dies. And f- in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, maybe if you removed the rocks and the thorns, it would stick. And this meant silly to say this, it's sort of obvious, but it's the first time that occurred to me. Yeah. And I thought, if I start removing these things out of my life, maybe it'll stick. And I remember getting on my knees and I prayed to God and I said, I will give you three months. Because I knew I, ca- I can't give him like one day. Like I knew enough that that's not a fair shot for him. I said, I'm going to give you three months, but I need you to come through. Because if you don't, I'm just going to drink myself to death. Like, um, But I said, I'll do my part. And I... Uh, that night or maybe the next day I was with Corinne. We had to do a project together and she's dropped me off at my house. And I said, Hey, your friend Pete, who leads that Bible. So you can try and get me to go ahead and give him my number. I'll, I'll go. And I mean it this time. Cause I'd said that in the past. I said, I mean it this time I'll go. And she calmly just nodded her head. Okay, great, great. I got out of the car. And she, she told me later, she just went crazy. Like she was so excited <laughs> that I was going to do this. Um, and so I gave God his chance, started going to a Bible study, got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ. Um, I quit drinking the best I could. I wasn't perfect, but I was drinking four nights a week for three and a half years. Probably maybe, I don't know, five to seven times over a two-month period I got drunk, which that's a lot for a person who's a serious Christian. That's a problem. But at that stage of my life, that was a big improvement. Right, right. Started exercising in the morning, studying more, and started really getting my life together. Um, what happened after about two months is, of course, I get the attention of the people on staff at Campus Crusade, that this guy's turning things around. I started sharing a little bit of my background, a little bit with the guys. Mm-hmm. And finally, Pete introduced me to a, a guy on staff named Tobias. And Tobias uh, met with me. And he said, what I think you need to do is go on a mission trip over spring break. I said, okay, where? And he said, to Panama City Beach, Florida, to share the gospel with partiers on the beach. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea for someone like me. <laughs> and he said, no, I think it's perfect. And so I said, I, I swear to you, before God, I swear, that I was going to say no. And I think this might be the only time I, that God controlled my mouth and <laughs> uttered a different answer. But I just said yes. And so I raised support, and I'm going to go on this trip. Well, none of the guys in my Bible study are going on this trip. So everyone going on this mission trip, I don't know any of them. Because Crusade was a big movement at that point. Oh, you mm-hmm. was 450 students. Right. Well, a few days beforehand, it's St. Patrick's Day. Now, my buddies, all my roommates were atheists and agnostics. I did not tell them the religious part of my life change. But I did tell them I was trying to exercise, cut down on the drinking. And that part they understood. I mean, we're all seniors at this point. Right. You know, a lot of us, are, we need to get beyond. You know, a lot of us quit smoking weed at that point. Like, we're trying to, like, transition into adulthood. Um, so that didn't bother them too much. But they just said, man, you never hang out with us anymore. St. Patrick's Day, just come on out. I was like, well, I'm 21. I'll just go have one or two, and then I'll head home. And the next thing I know, I woke up on this girl's floor staring at the ceiling. No idea how I got there. I'm not really sure what happened the night before. And I leave, and I'm walking home, and I thought, I, I can't go on a mission trip. Like, I'm too much of a hypocrite. But then it occurs to me, I just raised $1,500 of support. If I don't go, I have to return the money. If I return the money, I have to explain why. And this might be the only time maybe in life where God used the sin of pride to move his plan along. Right. But pride just took over. And I'm like, I can't do that. I got to tough it out. Mm-hmm. So I went and I'm sitting on the back of this bus and we're driving to Florida. And I'm looking at this sea of happy Christians in front of me. And I, just, I couldn't stand any of them. <laughs> the one thing that annoyed me when I was in college is how happy Christians were. It drove me nuts. Mm-hmm. That, that, I mean, how sick is that? But like, that was a very revealing of me. Yeah, is, but yeah. their happiness like drove me crazy. Hmm. And I'm sitting on this bus looking at them and I go, I don't even like these people. I don't want to be around them. I have to do this for a whole week. Well, of course, I get down to Panama City Beach and it just, it changed me forever. 
um, one of the girls, they would team us up with a girl, and we would walk the beach and go up to random people and ask them if they want to talk about Jesus. And we had different inroads to make that happen, but that's what we were doing. And we were going out, and I'm so nervous. And the girl I was with goes, she was really bubbly and wonderful. And she goes, I'll do all the talking. You just stand there. I said, sweet. <laughs> so I'll, you know, I'll go to the worship each morning, and I just stand around in the, in the afternoon. And she, t- she initiated the first conversation, and it went so-so. And finally, just, I'm not one of those types of people that do things, you know, half-hearted. So when I played football, like, I was all about football. When I partied, I'm like, I'm going to be the best partier at OU. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, if I'm down here to share the faith, I, I just got to jump in. Um, so I said, I'll do the next one. And so I started talking to these two guys, and I thought, I'm just going to tell them the truth. And I told them what I just told you. I told them about St. Patrick's Day. I said, a week ago, I was drunk. And I said, but Jesus Christ loves us, and he's got a better plan for us than this. And if he can forgive me, he can forgive you guys. And I was just honest with these two guys. And they stopped, and over time they looked at me and they go, the party life is, it's not worth it. And then they start telling me they're having the same experience in the party life I was before. And so where I thought I was all alone in all this suffering with the sin, what I discovered is that there's lots of people who struggle with this. And that boost of confidence the net, for the next five days, I was just honest with everybody I talked to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it took down their barrier because I would admit that I was fallen and sinful and um, I certainly wasn't talking down to anybody, but it was liberating me to tell them God has more for us and he'll forgive us for everything right here and right now. And he can put you on a new path right now. And that's what he did, not only for in those some of those guys' lives through me, but by the end of that week, I remember sitting on the beach looking at the ocean, the waves coming in. And I thought, I'm, I'm never going back to that. Mm-hmm. And from that moment on, I mean, my, my hair was on fire for Christianity. I mean, I went back to my campus and my parents, when I visited them, were just like, what in the world happened to you? You know, I, I left their house in January fat, drunk, and stupid. And then two months later, I'm going on a mission trip. I'd lost like 25 pounds. You know, I'm on fire for Christ. I, and I'm not interested in smoking weed and chasing women and drinking anymore. And really that week just set me on an entirely new path. Well, let's take a break there. You know, but a, a thought before we before we go to the break. Just, it's interesting that the part of the turning point was precisely you being in this position to tell your testimony. Mm-hmm. You know, because up to this point, it's interesting. Many, many stories, oftentimes people are, if they're getting into drugs and alcohol and things like that, it's because they've got some brokenness that they're fleeing from. And we all have that a little bit. But in your case, you, you know, you really we're kind of explicitly chasing happiness, mm-hmm. but it seems like in those conversations where you actually had to put it out into words, that's where the, I guess the the, the unfulfillment of it, exactly really, right, really uh, came home to you. Fascinating stuff, man. Yeah, <laughs> let's take a little break there. We'll absolutely come back and hear the rest. All Great. right. Uh, again, we're joined tonight by Michael Mason, former evangelical Protestant. We're going to hear the rest of his story here in just a couple minutes. I want to encourage you if, you, if you have a conversion story, if you are a convert to the Catholic Church, we'd love to hear that. If you go to chnetwork.org slash contact us, uh, we'd love to hear your story. Or if you are someone who's thinking about becoming Catholic, we'd love to be praying for you and walking with you on your journey. We'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Michael's story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, speaking with Michael Mason. He's a former evangelical Protestant and is now a Catholic high school teacher in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Michael, thanks for sharing your story with us tonight. Uh, It's been really fascinating so far. We left off, you just had this great experience of of sort of (laughs) falling into this mission trip uh, and giving it a go and discovering in your own testimony, um, uh, you know, your need for Jesus and your your need for faith and you're beginning to see your life turn around. Pick us up there and, and tell us what happened next. Yeah, so um, I had this life tra- life transforming moment down there, um, and sharing my story and being honest with guys helped me to clearly see what was going on. Um, what also helped too is I saw the party life with sober eyes for the first time. I could kind of step back and look at it and see its depravity. With when you're in it, you can't always see that, and so those two things together really made it real impactful. When I got back to OU, I was just I was my like I said my hair was on fire for faith. I was ready to go. I was meeting with that same Tobias later and basically saying, I want in leadership. I mean, I was just, I took the the energy I had for partying and just applied it to Christianity. And of course, they're trying to 
calm me down a little bit um, and slow things up. But uh, I was I was ready to go. And when you have a testimony like mine, um, people who have to raise support and money for their ministry are gravitated towards people like me because it's very tangible that God's doing something big. And so I was invited to, I've been invited many times to give my testimony. And that was true then as well. We would have once a week on Thursday nights, we would have our weekly meeting uh, and it was big. There'd be a band plan, a, a speaker, and they invited me to be, to give my testimony at that. And this was really the first time for me to um, say it in front of people. And I was in front of 450 people. I invited all my friends so that they were finally going to hear because I wasn't ashamed now. So now I'm going to evangelize with them too. And so I invited all of them to this moment. Well, they said, before you, we, we're not going to have you just show up and talk because you'll go on too long. And so the, the gist was they would team me up with someone and that person walks me through their testimony. And so um, there was a girl named Jenny uh, um, and she was friends with Corinne. So I knew her a little bit and they said, you guys will meet. So Jenny calls me and she says, uh, you know, let's go to Dairy Queen or something. I'm going to walk you through your story and help you get it down to, you know, a seven to 10 minute story. And she can tell. And I said, that's fine. fine. So we sit down and she says, you know, I, I know you're about to tell me a lot of really personal things. She goes, so I just like to tell you my background as well so that, you know, you feel more at ease sharing these really personal stuff. So she told me uh, her background and, and how she met the Lord in a really impactful way. And it was a really beautiful story. Um, so she tells that to me and says, okay, now tell me yours. And so I, I lay out my story to her uh, with all the gritty details that I just shared with you. And, um, and then after we were done, we sat and just talked for about two hours. And uh, a year and a half later, she was my wife, <laughs> which is why I'm very happy that I had to stay an extra year at OU because mm -hmm. I could have left without her, right. which would not be good. Um, it was kind of a funny way to start a relationship when you tell each other basically the worst parts about yourself right out of the gate. Um, everything looked rosy from there afterwards. <laughs> um, but she walked me through that. We didn't start dating for a, a while later. Uh, we were just friends for a long time after that because at that point I thought, you know, um, I liked her. But then I thought, uh, I'm not really sure what to do with a Christian woman. Like, these girls are too good for me. And I, you know, I interact with lots of not so virtuous women. I don't know what to do with a virtuous one. I think I need to grow up a little bit. Hmm. And then uh, I got the thought in my head at some point. It had to come from God because uh, it's probably too wise to come from me. But I thought, when I, I, want, I think I want to get married. And what should I look for? And I got the thought, I said, you know what? Like Jesus Christ is the most important thing to me. So the first thing a girl has to have is she has to love Christ more than she'll ever love me. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is she has to just be fun. We're going to do life together. I, I, wanted, I want this thing to be a grand adventure. And I want a girl that wants to go along with that adventure. And then she has to be cute because I'm a guy. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I thought those are my parameters. And uh, that first one, uh, Jenny fulfilled all three, by the way, and still does. Getting the thought in my head that I had to marry a woman that loved Christ more than she'd ever loved me, that prepared us for a future that neither one of us could have ever imagined. When we were sitting in that Dairy Queen in Athens, Ohio, um, we would never imagine we'd become Catholic someday. And so the fact that she wanted a man who loved Christ more than loved her, and I wanted a woman that loved Christ more than she'd ever loved me, really gave us our marriage the, the spirit necessary for God to do what he was going to do later. So right. God's wisdom was just at work in us, and we had just had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. Like his providence was just complete control. So we meet. Um, about this time, I'm sharing my faith like crazy. And my roommates are patient with it at first, and then they start pushing back because <laughs> they're all atheists and agnostics. Mm -hmm. And so they're pop posing questions to me, and um, do you really think God exists? And you believe a carpenter from Nazareth rose from the dead? Like, what are you talking about? And I didn't have any answers for them. And so when they would go partying, I would get online and look up answers and start reading books and things. Um, and so as I'm answering the questions, some of the answers I'm having a hard time finding the answers for. And then I'm also, see, I'm going to atheist websites, reading their material. And I had a little crisis of faith right out in that summer, that first summer, because my life had cleaned up at this point. Morally, I was cleaned up. Physically, I was much better off. Uh, socially, I had real positive friends. These new Christian friends were positive. But the Christian life also, um, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's not an easy thing to live out. You know, taking up your cross and following Christ is difficult. And so the, some of the difficulties started in at that point. So some of the, the consolations God gives us in the beginning, right. maybe for some people they have a very long honeymoon. Mine was a little bit shorter, mm -hmm. um, where the, the struggle of it became very in the forefront.
And I remember I, was, I didn't have any money, so I told my pastor, I said, I'll, I'll come do work out at the church. I don't have any money to give you for tithe, but I'll, I'll work to donate some of my time. He said, that's great. And so um, I remember I was weeding and things, and he comes out, and we're talking, and I said, I'm really struggling with some doubt, and I, I threw it out to him. And, and he, was a, he's a, he was a good man, but he looks at me and goes, yeah, those will, those will go away. And I thought, oh, yeah, they will. And then he went back inside and I went down to weed, and I thought, what if they don't? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not good. Mm-hmm. And so I had a real crisis of faith there. Luckily, um, on the radio, I heard what uh, later I learned was what a Christian apologist is. And so I stumbled along the radio station, and there's a guy in there defending the faith. And what I discovered is that there's a discipline in theology called apologetics where you can answer people's questions, and there's good answers. And so when I discovered this, this re enlivened my faith. <clears throat> you know, I'm only a few months into it, but re enlivened it. And so I just started reading like crazy to try to get at like how to answer people's questions. My zeal got out in front of my wisdom a lot. I would, um, I got my, I would offer, um, my zeal got way out in front of me. I would offer <laughs> to give talks and things like this in places when I just didn't know what I was talking about. Um, I thought I did because I read this one book on this one topic. And so quite a few times I'd put myself out there and, and get uh, smacked back down pretty good, um, <laughs> which was instructive that uh, maybe it did make sense that St. Paul had to go away for a few years to prep before ministry. Right. Maybe I should too. Um, but I really set on fire for this. And so we finish up that next year. We were invited to go on staff with Campus Crusade. I thought, I really like teaching. I'm not sure what God wants me to do. My wife is a teacher as well. We got married. And we thought, well, let's just move to Charlotte, North Carolina. And the reason why for Charlotte is at that point, all the baby boomers are still teaching in Ohio. So there's no jobs. And Charlotte was hiring like crazy. So we moved to Charlotte and I'm reading these books and I'm teaching English. Uh, We lived in Mooresville, North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. And I'm teaching middle school English um, at Mooresville Middle School. And I'm just reading apologetics books at night just for fun. And in time, I, I came to an author by the name of Norman Geisler, very famous, probably for my money, probably one of the best uh, Christian apologist there is mm-hmm. in the evangelical world, especially. And I'm reading one of his books on Islam. And as I'm reading, I thought, man, I wonder where this guy works. And I flipped the book around. It says the founder and president of Southern Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I thought, holy cow. I walk out and tell my wife, this guy's school is in Charlotte. It's like <laughs> an hour away from here. And so I decided, I said, I think I need to go and check it out. Because I didn't realize you could do something like te- teach apologetics for a living. And so I go down there and discover they have master's degrees in apologetics and in biblical studies and in philosophy and in master's of divinity and all this great stuff. And so I I go down to one of the admissions counselors and it's a gentleman by the name of Doug Beaumont, which is actually, he's Uh, been on the show before. Um, And so I met with Doug and you were talking through the program and I just think this this is what I want to do. And so I enroll in the program and I start attending Southern Evangelical Seminary. As I'm uh, attending, I initially was going to do a master's of apologetics. And what I discovered in time um, is that to be a truly good apologist, you have to be a good philosopher. Because apologetics, and it's a wonderful discipline, and I love it, and I have lots to thank for it. It's a little bit ad hoc. And what I mean by that is when you study apologetics, you just answer people's questions. But the, thing, the way you're answering them, you don't do the hard work of how are all these ideas tied together. Right. And so what I started realizing that is what I really need to study if I wanted to know my beyond my game is to study philosophy so I can answer the philosophical questions, but also a systematic theology. Um, Because if I could be trained in that, like a real principled understanding of what I was saying, then I could answer questions. I didn't have to memorize answers to questions. I could actually get to the root of where they were coming from. And so I took a class um, by a gentleman that um, was a great mentor to me and now he's one of my best friends. Um, named Jason Reed. He's also been a guest in the show. That's right, that's right. (laughs) Um, And he was an excellent um, professor. Um, Philosophy can draw guys who are a little on the nerdy side. And for a guy like me who likes sports and things, um, I needed someone like him because Jason's brilliant, super smart, articulate, charismatic, but he loves sports. So we would, you know, do all this great philosophy in class and then talk about college football and during breaks and things. So he was like the guy I needed to walk me through this. Well, I took my first class with him before I'd switched majors, and we did modern contemporary philosophy, and I was completely lost. Like, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. It was one week of intense philosophy. I'm studying all these things. And I get to the end of that, and I thought, this, this isn't for me. Like, I'm not smart enough to do this. It's too hard. Uh, if I can't do this, I shouldn't do apologetics. I'll just 
do an MA in Christian ministry or something. And so um, I finished the course. I get an A. He always reminds me that was a, he was being a little bit kind with that. Um, <laughs> but I did get an A on it. And I thought, wow, I got an A, but never doing that again. So that's that. Well, I was supposed to take an intro to apologetics class with Dr. Geisler, which I was real excited about. At the last minute, he had to pull out of the class and in walks Professor Reed, Jason Reed. And I thought, not this guy again. <laughs> like, he just <laughs> destroyed me. And the apologetics class was a little, it was a more entry level. And so I take the entry level part and he, we're, re, we're going through the ideas he taught me in the summer again. And I thought, I, actually, I think I learned, I learned more than I thought I did. And so we're in the hallway and I'm talking to a guy in my class and we're going over uh, Hume's thoughts of relation of ideas and matters of fact and stuff like that. And this guy's like, I just don't understand. It makes no sense. So I said, well, I think I know what he means. And I explain it to him. As I'm explaining it, Professor Reed walks through. He goes, what are you two talking about? And so I told him, I'm answering his questions on, he goes, would you tell him? And so I tell him the, I tell him what I told him and he goes, yeah, that's right. And he walked. And at that moment, I'm like, I'm going down and switching my major. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm switching to philosophy. And so at that moment, I just switched to philosophy and just fell in love with that. I took as many classes as I could from him as possible. And I was there during the glory days of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, the school was really healthy, it was going really well at that point. The professors were fantastic. And the group of guys I was in class with were really, really sharp guys. A lot of PhDs came out of that program. And not only were they really sharp, and Jason uh, was an excellent professor, but also these guys, we legitimately loved Christ a great deal. And so what was great about us, we're, we're studying all these ideas that are antithetical to Christianity. Like, if these ideas are true, Christianity is not. And that can be really intimidating to face those things. But when you're doing it alongside guys who are really bright, um, who are fun to be around, and who love Christ more than anything, um, it made the experience fantastic. And so all of us in this class are doing all this great material. And the way the classes were structured is we would study all these other people's ideas and metaphysics and epistemology or moral philosophy or whatnot. And then, you know, near the end of the class, we'd say, well, what does Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas say about this? So everything was always kind of through their, that lens of Thomas Aquinas. And so we would then look back and say, okay, this is what this thinker is getting correct. Okay, here's, here's some insights he has that it's helpful. Here's some things he's wrong about, but that's also helpful because it teaches us what not to do. And here's how Aquinas threads that needle. And so that was how, that's how I was taught to study and, and read philosophy. And I just fell in love with Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. And I fell in love with that Dominican tradition. Um, what I loved about Aquinas is, again, the, the, the difficulty of philosophy is intimidating. Even if you love it, it's intimidating. Most, If you talk to any philosopher, young philosopher, what they'll tell you is, I'm not smart enough to do this. Mm. And the answer is always, that's true. We we'll just keep going. Right, <laughs> right? Right, right. Like none of us are real great at this because mm -hmm. it's such a very, it's such a difficult thing. Yeah. It takes a long time. Long, it's a lifetime um, endeavor. But one thing I loved about Aquinas is he loved the truth. He'd follow it wherever it went, but he loved our Lord in a way that was undeniable. Yeah. Like he loves Christ and he's humble. So he's, you know, maybe the smartest human being that ever lived. He's definitely top five, but he's got humility and he, he sits under Christ's instruction and under the church instruction. And I remember that humility was helpful for me when I was doing my studies because I thought, you know, that's why I, I need to be humble when I approach these. And so following Aquinas' lead, he started becoming my patron saint before I understood that that was allowed. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm doing these studies, Eventually what happened is I started turning my philosophical reasoning skills onto the theology I was being taught in my other courses. And I saw a, a drastic difference between what we were doing in philosophy class and then the rigor of the theology program I was getting. And as I started turning that lens, a real cr a, another crisis in my life started to hit. Um, for people who have never converted, especially an intellectual com conversion, it's very difficult to understand how that works and why it takes so long. But the best way I can describe it is you have to go through a paradigm shift or a worldview shift. And so what happens is a worldview is how you explain everything around you. So if I was to philosophically explain what you and I are doing here right now, I'm going to bring my Christian view into it because that's how I understand all of reality. Right. When I was a Protestant, I understood the world from a Christian perspective, um, an evangelical Christian perspective. And that paradigm explained a lot. And so I could rest in it and it gave my life purpose and meaning and direction. As I started studying more theology, 
there started to be things that were anomalies at first, because every worldview has tensions. Right. Even the Catholic one does. We have difficulties and right. things Mysteries we believe. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there are, there's always tension. But as long as the tensions are only about 1% of your belief, it doesn't matter. Because it's like, you know, my, my faith explains the 99%. What happens is slowly it starts to chip away at it. And what happens slowly is through studying theology and looking at sola scriptura and sola fide and the real presence, I started realizing that what I was so sure and comfortable in that was true was slowly being chipped away 1% at a time. And I got to a point where I started having a crisis of faith because now my worldview, my way of understanding life and reality, the thing I've built my life on since college, doesn't, isn't making sense of the data, of scripture, of church history, of all these things. Right. And that's where I started to discover, like, I need to start looking at the Catholic Church because the Thomas Aquinas is shedding so much light. And he's studying all this theology. I'm starting to wander into his theology, and that stuff started making a lot more sense. And so as I started turning my, um, my gaze onto that, I started critiquing all those beliefs I had before. And as that um, started to happen, I started to realize that the Catholic worldview was now, it could explain the part of evangelicalism that was correct. So it was all there. All right. the positives are there. Right. Devotion to scripture, mm -hmm. evangelization, relationship with the Christ. Basic, the basic gospel. You it's know, all, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, we're good there. Yeah. But then all these problems I'm having, it's answering all of those. So now my worldview is filling back in. Well, as my worldview is filling back in, that's called a conversion. A lot of times you don't realize it's happening. Because in a weird sense, conversions are very slow and then extremely fast in my yeah. experience. Yeah. The slowness is that paradigm shift. You have to do all this investigation and prayer and study and reading and thinking and talking. And then you come to a head and you got to switch. And that's what happened to me as I came to a head. And at this time, I was slowly talking to my wife about it. And I finally came to a point and I said, I, I, I need to become Catholic. For, for the, and I you know, walked her through a lot of the theological reasons right. that I was seeing. And she was a little bit reluctant. She was raised in a church of God. Very, uh, I was part of the Assembly of God. Great parents, very faithful people. Her experience was more theolo or, uh, rich faith-wise than mine. But, she's, but because she loved Christ more than she loved me, because she took the scriptures seriously and she trusted me and she said, you know, you're the spiritual head of our family and, and I trust you, you're a thoughtful guy and a prayerful guy, she was willing to walk with me through that. And she knew full well she was going to have to come to it on her own. So we entered our CIA at a, a church in Salisbury, North Carolina, North Carolina. And I did my research to find a good parish to come into. Um, and I found one with, it was beautiful. It's funny because my wife, she liked evangelical culture more than I did. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the contemporary Christian music. And I wasn't into all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, like, we can go to this one parish. They have more, like, band stuff. This one's more, like, organ and incense. And she goes, Mike, if we're going to be Catholic, we just should go the whole, I just want to go the whole end. <laughs> so she actually said, let's just do the incense and the organ. Went to this beautiful church, had a great new young priest teach RCIA and through this year watching my wife she slowly started coming to it on her own and the thing that stood out to her was apostolic succession is it like November that year they lay out the fact that you can trace the popes through history and my wife on the way home just said we can do that's true and she's just so excited yeah. and I said honey we can buy a poster with all their pictures on it <laughs> if you want one and from that point we really um, kind of took off from there and what happened um, is we're coming in the church and I was having discussions with Jason Reed because at this point he'd already converted. And I said, you know, there's one, theologically I'm good. I, I you know, believe it. I said, but the Eucharist, the real presence, I'm, I'm not positive that he's there. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I can, all theological stuff's gone. But like, is he really, the, is that really him? And Jason said, you're not going to know it till you do it. And I thought faith is... It's not incompatible with reason. Mm -hmm. Reason can defend it and illuminate it, but I have to step. I have to assent. And I realized that I'm going to have to, I'm not going to know it till it's in front of me. And so at the Easter vigil, I was there and I walk up um, to the front and they hold up the host and they say, um, the body of Christ. And I stare at it and I thought, that is him. My Lord, my maker is right in front of me. And I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't even, I didn't even say amen. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I take me in that moment. I knew it. And so from there, our lives just took off. I was um, God by his grace brought us up to Cincinnati um, and, and really got us back on our feet. And when we were transitioning, um, 
in our faith to the Catholic part of our lives. We had a one-year-old at this point. My oldest is 11 now, James. Hmm. And he was the first person into the church because he was born the summer before. Right, right. So he was baptized in, in January. So he holds it over our heads. He's been the Catholic <laughs> longest. Um, but I have a one-year-old. I was teaching high school theology at this point. Mm-hmm. I just converted to Catholicism. I was honest with the, uh, the gentleman who ran my school. He was very gracious. He said, you know, can we just keep this kind of quiet for the next month or, and just finish the school year out? And he was very gracious, but I couldn't work there anymore. So I don't have a job. Um, I have this one-year-old, and I didn't know where to go. And so I just prayed, um, Lord, wherever you want me to be, just whoever gives me a job first, that's where I'll go. And one of the guys in Charlotte was trying to get me to Charlotte Catholic High School, um, but that didn't work out in time. And I got a call from a Dominican named Sister Mary Aquinas in St. Gertrude Church in Cincinnati. And she calls me up, and she looks at my resume, Masters of Philosophy, and she goes, do you want to teach middle school? Are you sure? And I go, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and... Um, so we did the interview, and she actually, I was hired a week before I became Catholic. Wow. Um, but St. Gertrude was a wonderful step for us. It's a really strong, great community up there. And we just needed time to become Catholic. And I was still very zealous for my Catholicism, like I was in my initial conversion. But I was a little bit older, a little bit wiser. And I knew that like just resting in this community for a little while um, was a good thing. And I taught religion to middle schoolers. That was a great start for me. Yeah. Um, because it's just, I get to share the faith, this passion I have, but at a level that's you know, for a convert's good. And I just had a, a nice few years to just settle into our new faith. And then from there, decided that I, I want to evangelize the world and decided to get a second master's degree in theology from the Athenaeum of Ohio, which is the seminary in Cincinnati. Um, got a, a job teaching high school, uh, co-ed high school at Roger Bacon High School in Cincinnati. So I taught co-ed for there for four years. But my real driving passion was to evangelize men. Um, and I was always hoping God would open that door for me. And I graduated from um, the Athenaeum in 2020, with my second master's. I had had eight years teaching experience at that point and was hired to uh, teach in Cincinnati in an all-boys school, um, Archbishop Muller High School. Um, and so my driving passion right now, aside from my wife and my children, so we have five now. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, 10 years um, Catholic and you have five children. Uh, mm-hmm. But James is our oldest. Mm-hmm. Uh, William is number two. Then we have Eva and Luke and Mary Claire. And I'm mentioning their names because they'll want to hear themselves on yeah. TV. Um, they're my driving passion and my legacy, of course. Mm-hmm. But I, God has opened a door for me to evangelize uh, young men and help them to know Christ and not fall in the, the pits of what I did when I was their age. Right. And so I talked to them a lot about is I understand the appeal of what you guys are being tempted towards. This is why it's a lie. And we spent a lot of time with that. Um, and the, the honor and the privilege is to every day, day in and day out, just preach the gospel, not only in um, deed, but in word. It's just a tremendous privilege. Um, and I just, I can't, it's amazing to me that God would open that door for me. Well, that's wonderful, Michael. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left. If you take a moment, again, uh, it's great to hear that you have this ministry now to young men, you know, like, mm-hmm. like your own story. Uh, If there are are some of those in the audience, people, you know, maybe caught up in that lifestyle or maybe later on in your journey, people who, you know, have this sense that their worldview just doesn't quite fit the data of their experience Mm -hmm. and what they what they believe. Give them a word of encouragement to keep going. Yeah, um, it's tough. um, It's tough giving advice. We don't know exactly where the guy is, of course. Yeah. Um, For young guys. The reason why I started my story with everybody wants to be happy because everybody does. Yeah. When I read Aristotle's Nick and McKeon Ethics. Um, everybody had this drive. I wasn't special in it. Um, I maybe thought about it more consciously than other 17-year-olds, um, but we all have this drive, and it's innate. And through either we think about what we're going to do to make us happy or we try things out and, and fail, we're all chasing after the same thing. And I encourage guys. I say, listen, when it comes to Catholic morality or spirituality of the faith, the fact you want to be happy is a good thing, and it's something to, worth being pursued. I don't want to turn that off. In the evangelical Protestant world, a lot of morals is very a don't, don't, don't. Mm. It's a rule-based religion. Right. You know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this for Jesus. In Catholicism, it's ordered towards our happiness and flourishing. Yeah. Jesus in John 10.10 10 says, I've come to bring you life and life to the fullest. The life he's talking about is the life, the spiritual life, the life of sanctifying grace. The life, the only true life worth having is the one that Christ offers us in his church. And so I tell guys is sin always, always ends in failure and death, always. 
either in small ways with venial sin or right. big ways with mortal. Right. But it always ends in the grave. Christ has come to bring you life. And, and then each guy one at a time work through that. And so I would encourage any listener uh, or anybody watching that if you truly want life, Christ is the only one that can give it to you, but you have to give him his fair shot like I did. And once I opened that door to him, he's, he took control from there. Oh, words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. Michael. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Thank you for your story and thank you for your ministry. We'll be pray, praying for it as it continues and for your family. Thank That's you so great. much. And thank you for being here for this episode of the Journey Home program. I pray that Michael's story was an inspiration to you. I encourage you to share this story. If you go to chnetwork.org slash stories, uh, we, we have, we'll, we'll have Michael's story, but it's uh, also many stories from every different background of people who have come to know Christ. And I, and I love those words of parting words of wisdom there that God put in into our hearts this desire for happiness. But it's a question of what is the way to happiness? What is the way, the truth, and the life? And we propose to you that it is Jesus. And so we want to share that with you. Check out those stories. We'll be back again next week with another conversion story. See you then.